Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to get started in just a few minutes and allow everyone a chance to log in. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We're gonna to go ahead and get started and I'll hand it off to our policy director, Chris Bostick. Great, thank you, Nichelle. Uh, and many thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, this is a very important topic, but uh, somewhat overlooked in our work. And we'd like to raise the profile a bit. My name is Chris Bostick. I'm the uh, policy director here at Action on Smoking and Health. Uh, a bit of background for, for any newbies. Uh, ASH was formed in the wake of the 1964 Surgeon General's report that first definitively established that tobacco use led to disease and death. So our mission is to promote the use of law and policy to combat the tobacco industry and save lives. So ASH is dedicated to not merely mitigating the tobacco epidemic, but eliminating it. If you examine tobacco through a human rights lens, which we do, you're left with the inevitable conclusion that the, the marketing and sale of tobacco products uh, or any product that is addictive and kills when used as intended is a gross violation of basic human rights. We would not put up with it with any other product and no industry has been given a, a bigger free pass than big tobacco. Uh, and that pass enables them to profit while killing over 8 million people a year. Many of you are, are aware of Ash's Project Sunset, which aims to phase out the sale of tobacco products. There are two cities in California, Beverly Hills and Manhattan Beach that have just done so. As of four weeks ago, it is illegal to sell tobacco in those two cities. As we work to build on that success, the number one barrier that we face is tobacco industry interference. This is an industry that's willing to spend tens of millions of dollars to stop a minor tax increase. So they'll stop at nothing to prevent themselves from going out of business. Uh, before handing the mic over to our first speaker, I'd like to give a quick history uh, demonstrating the extent of tobacco industry interference over the years. In 1999, the US Department of Justice filed a civil suit against tobacco companies under the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, or RICO. This, uh, this statute was originally designed as a tool to go after organized crime, uh, the mafia. But the federal court agreed that given the accusations, it was appropriate to use RICO against big tobacco. Seven years later, in 2006, federal judge Gladys Kessler delivered her opinion uh, finding that, and I'm quoting here, substantial evidence establishes that defendants have engaged in and executed and continue to engage in and execute a massive 50-year scheme to defraud the public, including consumers of cigarettes, in violation of RICO. She also concluded that the tobacco companies, and again quoting, have marketed and sold their lethal product with zeal, with deception, with a single-minded focus on their financial success, and without regard for the human tragedy or social costs that success exacted. So if you leave this webinar with only one takeaway, consider this one. When legislators discuss policy with a tobacco industry representative, they are collaborating with racketeers. 
So one bit of housekeeping before I hand it over, there will be a question and answer session following the speakers. Uh, there's a Q&A button on the bottom of your screen uh, for asking questions. Feel free to do that at any time. You don't have to wait until we're done with the speakers. Uh, and then at, at the end, I will try to get to as many of those questions as possible. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Barbara Shillow. She is the Senior Vice President of the Truth Initiative's Schroeder Institute. Barbara, the floor is yours. Thanks, Chris. I am really excited to be part of this webinar today. I just don't think this topic could be any more timely as so many of us in public health are actively working to reclaim science from those that would cast doubt on its facts and the evidence of what sound public health practice is, which is something that we know the tobacco industry has done in the past and continues to do today. So in that spirit, I have titled my uh, presentation, Revealing Big Tobacco's uh, Lies. And I am gonna just take a few minutes to focus on um, the initiative, Truth Initiative's resources around this topic of tobacco industry interference. So like Chris said, I'm a senior vice president at the Schroeder Institute, which is the research arm of the Truth Initiative. I lead a team of research scientists and associates we look at the impact of tobacco related policies and our research, per research portfolio includes uh, tobacco industry uh, surveillance. This has been an area that we've really expanded into and are quite active. Um, and so we really um, appreciate the opportunity to be part of the presentation today to highlight some of the resources that are available to all of you working in the field. Uh, next slide. So um, many of you know Truth Initiative, uh, uh, but for any newbies, I guess, or maybe a refresh, Truth Initiative is dedicated to achieving a culture where all youth and young adults reject tobacco. We speak, seek, and spread the truth about tobacco through our education efforts, our tobacco control research, which is where my efforts are focused, our community activism and engagement. And this is an area that actually is quite active around standing up to the industry. So engaging youth activists, youth leaders and youth voices across the country to speak truth, um, to speak truth you know, against the industry's very efforts that are targeted at them. And then finally, um, we do a lot of work in the area of treatment innovations, um, most recently in the area of um, helping young people um, quit, um, quit vaping um, uh, with so many um, young people targeted um, and part of the vaping epidemic. So uh, next slide. So tobacco industry interference. So truth has a long history in this area. So we've been working in this area really from the very beginning. Um, combating tobacco industry interference remains one of our strategic priorities today. And again, we're really pleased to partner with so many here. Um, to combat the strong arm ploys of the industry to impact tobacco control policy, um, to prevent effective tobacco control policy um, or put up barriers, uh, their attempts to recruit new users in the industry's attempts to retain existing ones. And you can see the dollars here, a $9 billion annual marketing budget, investing almost a million dollars each hour on promoting their products. And our research most recently tells us that the industry continues to play the long game here on public opinion and finding innovative ways to maintain and expand their interests. So these are some of the primary methods that the industry has historically used and then most recently uniquely used. So lobbying to undermine tobacco to control policies, as Chris mentioned, it's been in their playbook from the beginning, it continues today. But more recent, in more recent times, you know, paying influencers to post tobacco products on social media and hosting parties with giveaways and enlisting entertainment artists for music performances, all in um, the spirit of promoting their products and targeting young people. Um, manipulation of the media to discredit scientific research. This has been an area where the industry really has, I think, doubled down in recent years, really um, attempting to um, give themselves credit for uh, their self-funded research and cast doubt again on what we know are the credible sources of evidence, the strong scientific bodies of research that we've all built over time um, in terms of effective public health practice and the consequences of tobacco. Certainly the use of menthol fruit and candy flavors and sleep packaging has been a big part of their playbook recently. Um, as well as contributions to social programs and charities to create an image of corporate responsibility. Uh, next slide. Okay. 
So at Truth, we have been working hard, um, again, historically, but most recently to um, put efforts around disrupting the industry's efforts and doing that in partnership with our partners here today. Um, we really um, enhanced our research portfolio and we're working actively to track changes in Americans' perceptions of the industry. I'm gonna share a little bit about what we know um, from um, a national poll of adults um, and uh, an assessment of attitudes, a survey of attitudes among young people, um, and using that information to identify ways to disrupt the industry's marketing and reputation management efforts, as well as using that information to identify effective messages for youth and young adults to increase their anti-tobacco industry perceptions and motivate action against the industry. Because we know from the research literature that those anti-tobacco industry perceptions are protective factors for young people in terms of rejecting um, tobacco use. Um, next slide. So I'm gonna talk about two, um, two pretty substantial pieces of uh, research that we've done um, and that are available to you. And I'm gonna strongly encourage you to check them out because uh, they provide a, a wealth of information. So the first one is our um, spinning a new tobacco industry, how big tobacco is trying to sell a do-gooder image and what Americans think about it. This was posted at the end of 2019. And this really is two pieces. It's really an investigative piece that looks at what the industry is doing and provides a plethora of examples to illustrate those tactics. And then it also includes information from our 2019 national survey of adults that assessed their attitudes towards the industry. Both We asked both in terms of um, cigarettes uh, tobacco companies in terms of cigarettes, but also uh, vaping companies as well. And so I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, more specific strategies that really emerged from this report. And again, it's, it's a dense piece, but it's highly accessible um, and uh, I, I think really user friendly. And what we saw then um, in um, the review of the industry strategies is a real effort to expand their product portfolios to attract new customers and retain existing ones. So they're not relying on products of the past. They're always working on products of the here and now and products in the future. And emerging products will continue to be um, an issue that all of us will have to deal with in terms of tobacco industry interference. Marketing these products to youth and young adults, you know, in ways that they were, they were prohibited um, from the master settlement and some of the traditional avenues, they found the new ways to reach uh, these audiences. Um, working to improve their reputation among influential audiences and the general public, and finally cultivating influence with policymakers and lobbying against those policies. So really kind of reflective of the, 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 the essential playbook that's been around for a long time, but I think it's a, it's a fresh look at how they're engaged in these activities in the here and now. So I invite you to, to take a look. And then just briefly um, in this report as well, you'll find some findings from our national poll of adults um, in terms of the industry. So the good news is that the public is as distrustful as ever of the tobacco and vaping industry, despite their public relations and marketing strategies. So that's good news. According to this report, the majority of Americans strongly distrust the industry with more than 70% viewing tobacco, vaping and e-cigarette companies unfavorably. So that's good news. 63% uh, of respondents felt the tobacco companies mislead the public and 74% reported concern that e-cigarette companies use fruit and candy flavors to market their products to children. So we looked at some of those same attitudes towards the industry with youth and young adults. And that's this newer report that you see over here, seen through tobacco's big spin. And that was um, just posted last month. And to highlight a little bit of that, the next slide, please. I think again, some good news. Um, that young people are even less trusting. <laughs> Youth and younger adults are less trusting than adults. Um, and so when we look at the same items that we asked of adults, and then we asked it of youth and young adults, uh, we see um, higher percentages of youth and young adults recognizing that the tobacco companies are targeting them through candy and fruit flavors um, and less likely uh, to respond, don't know. And so we think that makes perfect sense. You know, youth and young adults are savvy, um, uh, young people um, and, and consumers, and they understand uh, what the industry is doing. And they're on the targeted end of these efforts. And so good news, but we need to remain vigilant um, to ensure that the industry messages don't take hold. 
Um, and as a result of that, we are continuing our surveillance in this effort, uh, in this area. And we'll have some new data on attitudes toward the industry to share um, with, uh, with you all in uh, sometime in, in 2021. So now I just wanna talk about some other resources really quickly here that are available to all of you. So next slide. Um, so how, uh, so these are all on our website and you're gonna get the slides and these are hyperlinks. So it'll be super easy to get to these reports. Again, you know, another piece that shows how tobacco is trying to make over its image. Um, there's a really interesting piece on how tobacco vaping companies are exploiting national crises to maintain their bottom lines by putting profit before public health. Um, Altria made a donation um, that we think really masks their predatory marketing of menthol to the black community um, when they make a $5 million donation to nonprofits that address uh, systemic racism. So that's an interesting uh, report. I invite you to check it out. Um, tobacco and pharmacies, I'll just call out here that um, you know pharmacies are a place where Americans seek products and medications um, for their health, for themselves and their families. And there's heavy extensive marketing at these very places. Um, and then finally, another um, tobacco industry marketing piece um, that you can find on our website. So we just pulled them all together in one place to make it easy for you and invite you to check these resources out. And then finally, I'll really end here with, uh, next slide please. Just reminding us that the industry has not let their foot off the gas pedal at all in, um, uh, 2020. So while many of us were um, home um, uh, grappling with the um, COVID epidemic and trying to keep ourselves and our family members straight uh, are safe um, and healthy, uh, the industry was quite busy. Altria had made a huge investment in 2019 in recreational cannabis. And then over 2020, we see them um, patenting cannabis technology. And the concern here, of course, is the growing intersection between vaping nicotine and vaping marijuana. So that's something that we're paying attention to and is potentially concerning. Um, in November, we saw British American Tobacco acquire Drift, uh, which is a oral nicotine product to compete in this fast growing category of nicotine smokeless products. Again, another example of expanding their portfolio with new products um, uh, to continue to retain customers and potentially recruit new ones. And then finally, uh, they capped off the end of the year in uh, December uh, with RJR taking action to further delay compliance with federal graphic warning labels and Rolling Stone and uh, Views, which is a fast growing vaping brand, uh, co-hosting a run of three virtual concert concerts that were live streamed from locations around New York City at the end of November. So just kind of ending here with a reminder that these efforts have not let up um, during this time of uh, COVID and national crisis. So that's really, well, you can go next slide, but that's really my presentation. We're gonna save questions till the end. And I've got my email here. I do invite people if they have questions uh, after checking out our resources, want additional information to contact me. I'll put you in touch with someone on my team that can follow up and help. So with that, I think I'm gonna hand it back to you, Chris. And thanks again for the opportunity. Great, thank you, Barbara. Our next speaker is Ann Boone. Uh, Ann is the Director of Research at the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. Ann, the floor is yours. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for, uh, for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I think this is a really useful re uh, webinar because it, it connects everyone together and sort of we can share um, the ideas that we have and the resources that we have um, because I think it, it's obvious that the industry uses the same um, tactics over and over again in different states and localities. So, um, so I think this is a really great venue for that. Thank you very much. Um, in case you're not familiar, the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids has been working um, to reduce tobacco use for over 20 years. Um, we work to change public attitudes about tobacco and promote, uh, and uh, sorry, promote policies that uh, reduce tobacco use and save lives. Um, so I'm just gonna go through some of the resources that um, TFK has um, to to counter the tobacco industry. Um, we, mo the resources that I'm mostly gonna talk about um, today are from the US, but, um, but we do have resources at the global level as well. Um, I've provided links to most of these to Ash. So um, in their follow-up email, you'll have links to them, but there's also, there are also links in this um, presentation itself. So that whenever you get that, you can just click on the link in this. So um, anyway, starting off, um, this is our Industry Watch website. This is where we house a lot of our campaign materials um, specific to the, the tobacco industry and their bad acts. Um, 
So for this is uh, this includes our, both our U.S. work and um, international work. So as you can see on the right side of the slide, this is just one of our campaigns that we put together to to talk about how um, big tobacco has been exploiting the COVID nineteen crisis um, to in, to increase their profits. Um, so for instance, you know, uh, talking about how um, e-cigarettes can help people quit and things like that. And you know, this is particularly nefarious, of course, because we know that smoking can um, increase the risk of severe uh, illness from COVID-19. Next slide, please. Uh, we also track um, tobacco companies' uh, political action committee uh, contributions to federal members of Congress. Um, this is again at the federal level uh, by state. Uh, we don't track state level data. That's a little bit um, more cumbersome, but, um, but that information is available at the Institute of Money in State Politics at followthemoney.org if you want to look for your own state. Um, but we also, th these resources that we have um, collect the um, contributions by company, as you can see in the little uh, call out box right there, by company, um, by year, and, um, and by political party. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as Chris mentioned, um, for the racketeering verdict, the RICO case, uh, we also put together a bunch of resources when um, the tobacco companies were required to put out these corrective statements, um, they, they were required by the um, by the the judge to put these out. They fought these statements for a long time, um, and so when they finally did, it was it was a pretty big deal. Um, and so we put together all these resources um, to help amplify the messaging. Um, so you can see in the call out box, these are just a few of our social media. Um, uh, Posts that you can download and use on your own um, on your own uh, social media accounts. Uh, we also have some TV ads that you can use, um, as well as some social media um, messages. Next slide, please. And if you know TFK, you know that we love our fact sheets. We have a ton of fact sheets. Um, so we in this sort of area of tobacco industry um, bad acts and interference. We have a bunch, including those just, that just talk about the industry's marketing in general. Um, we have fact sheets that talk about uh, marketing to specific populations, such as African Americans or women. Um, and then we also have some fact sheets that talk about um, the industry's sort of general bad acts. So, um, so things like uh, their um, their youth prevention programs that aren't actually youth prevention programs. Next slide, please. Um, and again, I just want to mention. Um, it's not linked on the actual slide itself, but you'll see a, a list of links at the end of this um, presentation that you can go to to get to our fact sheets. Um, so this is just one fact sheet that I did want to highlight because it's specifically um, relevant to this presentation. Uh, it talks about how the tobacco industry has engaged at the state and local level to oppose um, proven policies to reduce tobacco use. So it highlights some recent examples um, from you know, their, um, their contributions to, uh, to oppose ballot initiatives at the state level for tobacco tax increases, um, to contributions to local um, policymakers, to contributing to, uh, to front groups to help um, oppose tobacco control policies. Next slide, please. So I wanted to shift a little bit and talk about some of the activities that we've been doing, that TFK has been doing to monitor the tobacco industry. You know, obviously we put together these fact sheets and other resources based on what we've seen the industry do. Um, but, uh, you know, while it's important to, to share the, the resources that we have, I think that it's also important to highlight um, not only how the tobacco industry is engaging, particularly uh, in, um, in opposing tobacco policies, but just their general bad acts, because I think these examples can help reinforce um, the dangers of working with the tobacco industry if, for instance, legislators are, are considering, you know, um, working with the tobacco industry on certain policies. Um, and it just shows that they continue to, to target youth and, and do things to, um, to booster their bottom line um, at the expense of public health. Next slide, please. Um, the uh, Federal Trade Commission puts together these reports on uh, marketing expenditures and, and Barbara mentioned um, some of the statistics in her slides as well. Um, but these, uh, these reports are really helpful to show how much the industry has been spending, both generally uh, marketing their tobacco products, but also in specific areas. So we have um, this fact sheet that you can see on the left side of the slide, 
but you can also see, uh, we also put together charts that sort of show the breakdown and where they're spending their money. Um, so you can see, uh, it might be kind of hard to see in the slide, but uh, the main black bar is showing pricing policies. And again, that's highlighting how much they're putting into pricing policies to keep the, the prices of these tobacco products low. Um, next slide, please. Um, we're also looking at how uh, the tobacco industry has been sponsoring events. Um, and again, Barb Barbara mentioned um, these rooftop sessions that uh, Rolling, um, Reynolds American paired up with Rolling Stone to put together. So, um, so we've been sort of monitoring, particularly through so social media, how the industry has been um, has been highlighting their partnerships and their sponsorships of these um, these events to not only um, provide sort of a, a fun image of their product, but also to amplify their um, their products themselves. So, you know, when Shaquille O'Neal has his fun house and it's sponsored by Swisher, and then he posts about it on his social media, um, his followers who aren't necessarily tobacco users, who aren't necessarily following Swisher, will suddenly be exposed to the Swisher brand and the sort of the, the goodwill marketing of Swisher to put on these types of events. So those are the types of things that we, um, we try to follow. Um, there's um, the industry also, you know, again, keeping in mind their, uh, their bottom line, they also are promoting their products through pricing policies, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the, the post on the left is, um, is from Velo, from Re Reynolds American. Um, and it shows that, you know, they're, they're trying to build on top of this, um, on top of a Black Friday promotion to, to get people to buy their products. And then also they engage in sweepstakes, again, to engage um, consumers to, to buy more of their products so that they can enter into these sweepstakes. Next slide, please. Um, and of course, we're also tracking new new products and new flavors. Um, some of these products, we're not really sure how they're on the market given the FDA's uh, pre-marketing requirements, but we are tracking to see how the industry is marketing these new products. So you can see uh, new flavors for e-cigarettes, uh, new flavors for cigars, and of course, um, these uh, nicotine uh, products that, that Barbara mentioned. Um, again, it's important to, to highlight these products because, you know, you want to, we want to use these to show how the industry is putting out these products that are very popular, uh, that can attract youth, but it also shows that they're trying to skirt, um, they might be skirting regulations. So with things like this, we will probably report them to, um, to FDA to make sure that they are, um, are going after these companies for uh, possibly violating FDA regulations. Next slide, please. Um, and again, the industry is always trying to make themselves look really good so that they can um, be considered partners uh, or stakeholders um, with legislators and policymakers and the public. So these are just a few of their posts and press releases to, um, to, to show how good they are to the community, how much they co are concerned about racism and diversity and, and those types of issues, as well as the environment and LGBTQ um, issues. So again, they're always trying to improve their image because they want to be seen as a credible source and a credible and likable um, company to work with. Next slide, please. Uh, and then finally, of course, as you know, sort of the, the basis of this webinar, um, op opposing policy. So these are sort of examples from different companies um, uh, opposing policies in different ways. So on the left, you'll see an example. This is a, an ad from a convenience store mag trade magazine um, that's appealing to retailers to work with Altria and, and saying how, if you work with us, we will help you um, defeat policies to, uh, that would affect your business. The middle is um, a, uh, uh, an email that was sent to, uh, from BD Vapor, an e-cigarette company, to talk about, to oppose flavor policies. Um, and then on the right, you'll see different, um, a flyer and a point of sale ad to, um, to encourage consumers to oppose ballot initiatives to increase the uh, tobacco tax increase in North Dakota and, and Colorado. So they're, they're working at different levels um, to, to encourage people to, to oppose tobacco, uh, sorry, to oppose um, proven tobacco control policies. Next slide, please. And um, with apologies to Rosie the Riveter, I wanted to put this up because I wanted to, um, 
highlight the importance of you all in helping us track down these, um, these examples of industry bad acts. There's only so much that we can do from, um, from our DC office. And so we really do um, uh, rely on examples that you all send in and share with us and you know share both with us and among the advocacy community as well because again it's important to see how the industry is doing the same things over and over again using similar arguments using similar um, uh, tactics and and resources um, and uh, and you know one example in one state might pop up in another state. And then if you can share resources on how you've been com combating that, um, I think that goes a really long way. So, so uh, this is just an appeal to you to share your examples and share what you've done as well. And next slide, please. And finally, these are our resources. Um, you, uh, you know, hopefully these, uh, these links will work, but again, um, Ash will be sending around a, another email that should have, um, have these resources that you can link to. And with that, that's it. Thank you very much. Terrific, thank you, Anne. Uh, our next speaker is our own Megan Arendt. She is the Associate Director of Communications here at Ash. Uh, Megan, it's all yours. Awesome, thank you, Chris. So I will be talking about effective earned media strategies. So what to do with everything that was just presented. Next slide. These are the overarching elements of a communications campaign under what's called the PESO model. It's an acronym for each of the categories that you see on the slide. It's a lot to look at right now, I know, but I'm sharing it because I'm positive the tobacco industry is using every part of it. So our community needs to do, do so as well. Today, we will dive into the work that leads to the earned media results. Um, and share some of Ash's owned media that you can reuse and get traction across your own shared media, um, as well as then getting that earned media. And just to note, like people have said, you'll get these slides after today. So I definitely recommend coming back to this slide and just reading through all the different parts and thinking through if you are doing something in each of those categories. Next slide. So starting with what we have, Ash has reports, graphics, and videos ready made for you to use in your state and local work. CTFK and Truth also just shared their own media assets that you can use as well. So there's a lot of resources that already exist. Today, we're all talking about shining a light on tobacco industry interference in lawmaking because we've seen data that shows that when you talk about it and you do shine that light on their interference, it's one of the most effective ways to combat it. The tobacco industry is hoping that their work goes unnoticed. So it's up to us to note it <laughs> and tell other people about it. Many lawmakers really don't know that tobacco industry is trying to influence or still is influencing um, a lot of our public health laws. So it's up to us to educate them and our fellow citizens on that interference. Um, and ASH's Interference Index is an annual report that we do. And so we're talking through the data and examples provided by state and local advocates like yourselves. And so the link is on the previous slide. And so I'd encourage you all to read and use that tool Along with the release of that report in December, we made a lot of content for you to use across different channels. So on this slide, you're seeing the social media graphics that we made um, for you all to use. These are, well, we made one social media graphic for each of the examples that the state and local advocates provided to us, which is a little bit of a plug to send us your examples as well as sending them to CTFK so that we can make graphics for you guys to help promote um, what's happening, not in a positive way, obviously, but to shine a light on it, to try and combat it. Uh, these are graphics that you can use on social media, on your website, or even when you're doing a media pitch. Next slide. So when it, when the next, yeah, here we go. Um, so all of the graphics that were on the previous slide, along with the report, are available for download at that slide or at the link on the slide right there. Um, and then in addition to that, we have the videos on the left-hand side. Those are available on Ashorg USA, which is our YouTube channel, but we've also included the raw video files in that link that you're seeing on the right-hand side. So you'll see the social media content and in that Dropbox link, 
as well as the raw footage so that if you want to make your own videos to produce with your own logo, to share either with your local media or on social media, you can. The content already exists. One of the videos is actually an interview with Barbara who you already heard present from CTFK. So we have a lot of resources ready for you guys to use um, on whichever platform you're most interested in. Um, it's important to also just note that a lot of media outlets prefer if you can share a multimedia element with them when you're pitching them. So sharing a graphic or a video is really useful. So if you don't have the resources to create those yourselves, where our goal is to help you already be able to find something. Next slide, please. Or if you'd like, you can make your own earned content. Um, I can't highly, I can't more highly <laughs> recommend Canva. This is the website that we use. It's a free service. They give you templates. And so you would just sort of edit in your own information. They tell you the dimensions of every single platform that you could need. And they also have some free photos and elements that you can use. Our entire index and all those graphics that you just saw all the way down to the YouTube video covers were all designed in Canva, not by a professional graphic designer. So I'd encourage you to give it a try and strengthen your earned media production. Next slide, please. So once you have the content to share, you need a strategy to do it. We won't really dive in a ton onto the strategies of every single platform um, right now, but the main ones Ash uses are Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube. So we'd encourage you to share your message on as many platforms as you can to earn more traction. Um, and then again, we gave you sample social media posts in that Dropbox link. In addition to the graphics, we gave you like the actual text as well that you could use. Next slide. So if you remember that initial peso graphic at the beginning, paid media was also an element Again, we're not diving into that today because it requires a larger budget and more time to discuss. So we'll focus more on earned media for the rest of my presentation. Um, you may have already seen this quote from Malcolm X on the role of media, but it demonstrates why advocates, um, as advocates, we must harness the power of the media to convey our message. So on the slide, Malcolm X says, the media is, most powerful entity, the media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and to make the guilty innocent. And that's power because they control the minds of the masses. So clearly the tobacco companies would like the media to miscategorize them as innocent bystanders, which means it's our job to ensure tobacco companies are accurately portrayed as the perpetrators of a global epidemic every single day. Next slide, please. Press releases are likely one of the first things that you think about to garner media attention. On the slide, you can see an eight part standard release from CoSchedule. Um, this is just to give you the basics if you haven't done a press release before. Um, a, little, a few tips from me personally, their number four recommends opening with a bullet point. And I usually put that after our intro paragraph with which they've labeled number five. I've seen a lot of other organizations maybe put them at the bottom um, or halfway through. So feel free to play around with that. Um, you don't have to follow this exactly, but it tells you the different parts. So you should at least be including all of those parts in your press release, specifically contact information. And then at the end, that final boilerplate text that describes your organization, make sure you have that. And aside from formatting, it's also key to have a piece of new information to share something that's truly newsworthy to more than just your organization. Um, so survey results are great to share. Reports are also a great one to share. Um, you've heard all of us present all of those for you today. So you can definitely talk about those. Um, and we hope that uh, some of those local examples will also speak to your local community. A lot of times talking about being highlighted or met your community being mentioned in a report is newsworthy in your local community. So we would encourage you to do that. Um, and again, you can, on the slide, it talks through where you can promote your press release. And so um, don't just send it out to media. You should also post it on your website, post it on your social media. 
um, send it in personal emails to local reporters who cover health, public policy, or business. And then if you have a database of supporters, email it out to them. Um, and then if you have the budget, you can do a paid wire service. Um, we'd also encourage you to do press events. We've held press conferences, both in person and virtually, um, actually getting more substantive attendance by reporters on our virtual events. And that was even before COVID, um, likely because reporters are really busy and it's easier for them to hop on a call or a Zoom with no added travel time. Our last press conference we held virtually with guests from California, DC, New York, and Spain. So just think if we had been hosting that in person, it would have cost a lot more money with travel um, or we would have had to cut back on some of the speakers. So I definitely encourage you to try hosting a virtual press event. Um, again, only if you have breaking news to share though. Um, on the logistics that I have on that slide, my initial email invitations I sent to reporters and required them to reply to me to personally register which gives me control over who's attending. It gives me the chance to not let a tobacco representative get the login. And then it also shows me who I wanna personally follow up with after that call um, to see if they need any information to build a story um, and just see what I can do to help. Also, if you broadcast your Zoom conference to YouTube, like we do for these uh, webinars, you'll have that immediate link ready to share with reporters who missed the live conference. Um, giving you space to get more attention with it. YouTube also gives you um, a feature where you can embed your YouTube link or video on your website and then also share it on social media. So get the most use out of what content you have. Next slide, please. So letters to the editor are also really important and I'm sure a bunch of you have tried submitting them before, just some tips um, that we have is that a letter to the editor needs to be a response to something already published in that specific paper. Don't reply to the New York Times about something you saw in the Washington Post. If, if it was a New York Times article, that's what you're replying to. That's what a letter to the editor um, includes. And so you only have 100 words for an, a letter to the editor. Definitely no more than 150. Um, it, it's intended to be short and you only have two days from the day it was published to submit your response and have it be seriously considered. So act fast if you see an article uh, that you do wanna to respond to. Next slide. So next is op-eds. This is a challenging one for a lot of people and um, it's a space I'd recommend trying to get into when, when you're able to. Um, and so these are eight, uh, key points that I'm gonna talk through with you all. Um, come back to this slide when, when you have time, but save all eight, don't do only one. You should, it's an inclusive list, um, not just pick one. So for the first one, make sure you have a single topic to cover and a clear point um, and have facts and data ready to support that point. Keybridge Communications says, if your piece doesn't tempt one fourth of the population reading it to reply to the paper to disagree with you, then you don't have an op-ed. So that's a good barometer of whether or not you have that single topic that's compelling and gonna motivate a lot of people to be upset with you and disagree. Uh, second, an op-ed formatting is different from academic writing. You use very short paragraphs that are only four to five lines maximum. So if you're used to academic writing, think differently in this case. Uh, number three, ideally your submission would be 550 words maximum, definitely no more than 750 words though. Number four, don't submit to the newspaper until you have an attention grabbing headline to attach to it because you're first pitching the editor until you need to catch the editor's attention first and foremost with that one email. Number five, many editors may only read your opening paragraph, so make it count. Think of a news hook or, hook or something really important going on right now or a compelling story. But again, you have that four to five lines. So start, start as strong as possible. Um, number six, pitch the news outlet that is right for your goals. That doesn't mean the paper needs to agree with you though. Remember that first point of tempting people to disagree with you? <clears throat> so what you, it, I'm really just saying is pitch as local as you can because it'll be more relevant to that audience. 
everyone pitches to the New York Times and Washington Post. So your odds will go up if you're pitching to a local paper about something happening in your community. And then especially with that strong hook, showing them how it relates. Number seven, the email message asking an editor to read your op-ed is just as important as the op-ed itself. A lot of times the submission process, you would paste the op-ed into the body of your email if you haven't done one previously. So a lot of people, um, that email message at the top is a last minute, check this out. Don't do that. <laughs> you should really use all of your best information in that pitch email because again, it's even shorter. If they're only gonna read the first sort of four lines in your headline, your email body is the crucial thing. It's where you can spoil the ending. You can repeat anything that's coming because the pitch email is not going to be published. So that's your chance to share a lot of really, really exciting information. Um, the author of the op-ed can also personally submit it if you know them well enough, um, briefly stating their credentials as well. And that can sometimes give you a slight leg up. Um, it's not required because I know a lot of times we're trying to get someone else to do an op-ed on behalf of us. So if, you, if you're not able to have them personally submit it, that's fine as well, just an option. Um, and then eight, follow up the next day. A lot of papers say that they need three or so days, but if your topic is entirely newsworthy and it's really about the news cycle right now, you wanna be pitching a new outlet already the next day. So follow up, you can pick up the phone and give them a call. If you're concerned that they're still gonna come back to you because you think it's that good of an op-ed, just send them an email the next day saying, I'm moving on to the next outlet so that they know it's no longer exclusive to them. Next slide, please. And then blogs, you can always publish your content as a blog on your website if it's not picked up. If you wrote maybe an LTE or an op-ed that we just talked about and it doesn't get picked up, reuse that content somewhere else. Put it as a blog on your website, take a few points of it and put it on social media. But uh, I also wouldn't be doing my job at ASH if I didn't point out that we have guest blog opportunities at ASH. So maybe that great op-ed or LTE wasn't picked up in your area and you wanna email it to us and see if we'd like to publish it, please do. Um, we love using our blog, newsfeed and social media to highlight the great work of our shared community. So if you'd like to write something for us to publish or have a big news win that you want us to share across Ash's social media, please do email me and we'll see what we can do. And my contact is on the next slide for you. Awesome. Hey. Thank you, guys. Great. Thank you, Megan. Um, our final speaker is uh, Julie Bisbee. She is the executive director at the Tobacco Settlement Endowment Trust. Uh, Julie, the floor is yours. Great. Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for um, the wonderful resources presented in advance. And now I want to kind of show you how we have used some of those communication strategies in Oklahoma to continue to highlight how the tobacco industry is impacting our state and our policies. Next slide, please. So a little bit of background about um, our organization. Uh, TSET stands for the Tobacco Settlement Endowment Trust. Uh, we were created by voters through a state constitutional amendment after our state and several others sued Big Tobacco um, and settled with the Master Settlement Agreement. Uh, so we are constitutionally protected our mission is to improve health and the quality of life of Oklahomans. We do that through accountable programs and services. We fund grants at the community and statewide level, as well as our state's um, tobacco helpline. And we work with other state agencies, public health groups to advance that work. You know, exposing the tobacco industry is really foundational to our work. Um, we had a very active attorney general at the time of the um, Master Settlement Agreement, Drew Edmondson, who called this a righteous lawsuit, and he's very inspiring in that way and highlighting how the tobacco industry had harmed his state. Um, we continue to carry that legacy forward as we use the earnings from the endowment. And just for, you know, some of you, um, I was reacting to some of the previous presenters, some of the things that we do as an organization, as a state agency to ensure that tobacco industry influence is not rampant in our work is that our endowment investment policy excludes 
tobacco as part of our earning. Um, and then grantees and contractors must also sign an affidavit that they do not receive tobacco funds. So it's one more way that we are able to exclude this predatory um, industry from seeking to meddle in our work. Next slide, please. So Oklahoma has a long history of um, tobacco industry influence. And I'd be remiss if I did not call out um, Doug Matheny. I know he's worked with Ash on several research pieces. He is based in Oklahoma, housed at the Health Promotion Research Center, and has spent a lot of time combing through ethics records, um, legislative votes, and has really been a leader in our state on that. But we, at any time, have had 12 to 14 registered lobbyists at our Capitol advocating for big tobacco. Um, published documents through their own um, court orders show that tobacco companies have directly interfered in Oklahoma lawmaking for decades. Um, we had um, banning on smoking. We had ordinances to ban smoking as far back as 1976 in Oklahoma City um, in 86. Um, you know, we had a community that was looking to restrict smoking in workplaces. The tobacco industry each time made it a point to either stop those efforts or ultimately work on preemption at the local level to weaken cities' abilities to protect people. And so that is something that we hearken back to quite a bit um, as we are letting the public know who is setting the laws and the priorities for them. So some of the ways that we engage and provoke engagement, very similar to some of the things that Megan spoke about, is we use print ads, television ads, radio, uh, blogs, op-eds. And so I'm going to show you some of these examples today so that if this were something that your organization wanted to do, you, know, you can kind of see how it's been applied um, at the state level. Next slide, please. So one of the ways that we do this um, is through our health communication intervention. So a portion of our budget has been earmarked for this best practice um, public education effort. And we do that through our Tobacco Stops With Me brand. Um, a couple of the activities that that brand has done um, includes campaigns on their corrective statements. Um, we have a campaign right now that's called Not Okay. Um, we also have a social campaign that shows in their own words how Big Tobacco made a consorted effort to target certain groups. And we also at our local level have a red kit um, which shows you candy and tobacco products. You tell the difference. So it is again, very um, concrete example of how the tobacco industry seeks to interfere and um, you know, really confuse people about the truth. As they said, doubt is our product. And we know in our state, we're a populist state, Oklahomans are independent, um, that we have to be very clear about we're what we're showing them. We can't just say you've been manipulated and that's enough. We need to show them how and we need to use facts and we need to use concrete experiences. Next slide, please. So this is an example of our corrective statements campaign. And this was something that we did after those statements were published in 2017, um, we worked with some of the um, African American nonprofits to get the word out on the menthol one. But we looked at the five things, you know, that the tobacco industry was forced to um, publish, and really wanted to be sure that the public, our public, who is, um, you know, sometimes seeking truth, and I don't believe that, and that can't be true. We wanted to show them absolutely. These are legitimized claims that big tobacco has been meddling and lying and deceiving. And there was evidence presented, testimony taken, and a judge made a decision. Um, and that was really helpful to us to say, this isn't just um, you know, a public health agency telling you how an industry is bad. This is the judicial system convicting an industry of the same thing that the mob has been guilty of. And that was really powerful in our state because there's a lot of times, you know, as we're reclaiming science, that people are skeptical of these sorts of things. So this was really a defining moment where we could put that out there and say, no, this is true and let me show you how. Next slide, please. 
So we ran um, a social campaign. We had television commercials. All of these things were coming out. And it was also somewhat um, strategic on our part because we knew that a lot of the media methods that the tobacco industry would use to publish corrective statements were out of date. You know, they had waited so long to get this going and had fought it for so long um, that relevant media then was not relevant now. And so it was really important to us that we amplified um, the, these messages. So you can see we had social media interaction and um, we attracted uh, comments from folks that we might not normally um, attract, but it also was letting us know that this message was um, kind of filtering down to to the folks that we wanted to make sure they heard it. Next slide, please. So on this slide, if all the technology wizards are, are with us and working, um, we do have some links to video, if we can click on one of those. Big Tobacco lied for decades about manipulating nicotine levels in cigarettes. Legally, here's what tobacco companies are forced to say now. Here's what they're really saying. And the lies. It stops with me.com, a program of TSET. Thank you. And thank you for technology working. I don't know how many conferences I've been on where the video plays and there's no sound. So call that a win today. But, um, you can see in that commercial that the tobacco industry litigated each and every word that they were going to be forced to put out um, in those corrective statements. And as a trusted messenger, which is another you know, thing that we pride ourselves as a state agency and also an upstanding um, authority on health, it was important for us to say, this is what this really means. And when you boil it down to the essence of it, it's hard to ignore. And so we have several of those, and you can go through those links as these slides are made available. Um, but these were television commercials that we ran. These were um, digital posts that we ran. We have it on our YouTube. This is also helpful for our local grantees who might be working in different parts of the state, but they have social media. They can put this out there. Um, if they're partnering with youth groups, they were able to put that out there as well. Next slide, please. Oh, it may go through each one of those. There we go. And so this is our Not Okay campaign. And we launched this because it was really important for us to challenge and change the way that Oklahomans thought about tobacco laws, sort of that denormalization of existing you know, tobacco industry influence. We wanna say what they're doing is wrong. Um, other states have these protections in place. So we created the Not Okay campaign. Um, it was a seven point plan um, with a lofty goal to cut adult smoking in half over the next decade. Um, in that center piece, you can see what we did with partner outreach. We had um, sort of a slick uh, collateral piece that outlined all of the ways that um, our state could improve by modernizing their tobacco control and prevention policies and somewhat the cost. At the same time, that collateral piece included public polling. So when you were at the Capitol, um, at least in Oklahoma, a lot, of, a lot of people say, well, you know, I've, I've got a lot of constituents that smoke and it's really important to them to be able to, you know, go to their favorite local bar and have a beer and a cigarette. And it was really important to us to get an accurate read on that. And so over the years, as part of the Tobacco Stops With Me campaign, We've asked those questions to gauge public opinion. And what we did in this partner outreach piece was show actually the majority of Oklahomans support protecting others from secondhand smoke. Again, sort of turning that on its head because if you're at the Capitol or um, you know, you're a lawmaker having your, your weekly coffees, you're hearing extreme viewpoints. Um, on any issue. And it was important to say, no, actually, this is where the majority are. Um, at the same time, we had print ads that highlighted how the tobacco industry has gone after children. You can see that, um, you know, in their own words, they've said, if um, children can start um, using tobacco before 18, then we've got a customer for life. It was important to us that parents saw that, that parents were getting a look at these um, vapor 
flavored vapor product devices. Uh, some of them look like USB drives. Some of them look like highlighters. Um, this is just another way that the tobacco industry is trying to, once again, appeal to children. Um, and so when we launched this effort, we also pulled together a coalition. So we had a really large group. We collected emails. We had them um, sign up, put a pin on the map to visually show the support that the majority of Oklahomans want to see change. Next slide, please. And so this is sort of that statewide um, application of some of those strategies of uh, we do op-eds. Um, you know, one of our most widely shared op-eds in this uh, business journal, the journal record, was when we pointed out the connection between Altria and um, the Oklahoma Center for, oh, I can't even remember. It's called OCPA. I can't remember off the top of my head in this moment. Um, however, they are affiliated with the um, state policy network and Altria lists them directly as a charitable um, entity that receives funds. So kind of has been the pattern as a state agency that has money that is independent of the legislature. Um, those of you who've been around state capitals know that there's some tension there. And in the past, this organization had taken it upon themselves to attack or to come after certain programs, um, label us big government sort of nanny state. And um, what we did was say, you know, you all need to consider the source. Um, and that was well received within the um, capital core because this organization has been used to um, thwart a lot of efforts. And so we use that opportunity to get out there. Um, one of the things that we do in advance of our legislative session, which starts in February, is lay out all of the policy deficiencies that our state has, and also pinpoint the fact that at every turn, a tobacco lobbyist is working to protect their business model. At the same time, we've used blogs as well. Um, we recently um, had a blog on preemption. That's something that we are um, seeing additional conversation about in our state, especially as um, mask mandates are something that um, our state leadership has said is a local issue. So let's talk about local control. We're really into that. Let's look and see how that is consistently applied. And so that created an opportunity for us to very directly show how the tobacco industry put legislation on the books that makes their lives easier. They can concentrate their influence at the Capitol versus going municipality to municipality to ensure their business model remains intact. Another thing that we have started doing recently um, is podcasts. Next slide, please. So you'll find a link to this um, at the end of this slide deck, but this was also a really easy way to um, kind of unpack a concept that is complicated and I think for the most part should make most Oklahomans pretty angry. Um, understanding how the tobacco industry worked to ensure preemption stayed in place. So this is a 20 minute podcast, you know, people are um, got headphones in their ears all the time or trying to walk the dog or just create some space between their pandemic buddies. Um, podcasts we've seen really be a popular thing. Um, this is something that our intern puts together. So this might be a, a low cost um, way for your organization to get that information out. And next slide. One of the other things that we also um, did was look at those industry documents and create social videos, um, social campaign around um, targeting. So you're using big tobacco's words against groups that we've traditionally, you know, kind of held in high esteem, especially one that was popular here in Oklahoma with our veterans one, um, where big tobacco talks about how they target the military. Uh, we also highlighted um, industry efforts to target African-Americans, women, um, LGBTQ, and also youth. And so um, making sure that the organizations that served those various groups also had access to that um, and had an understanding of how they could help um, promote or extend that message. There in the center is the example of the red kit. 
So we have grantees in counties across our state, urban and rural, and they are all equipped with this red kit. It comes with um, kind of instructions so that anyone could use it. It's a way in the past, um, pre-pandemic, that they have worked with youth. Um, this is something that you can train your youth partners to use. This is something that you may train volunteers to use if that's something that applies to your organization. But you can see, uh, again, a very concrete example of how the tobacco industry attempts to market, lure children, and um, you know, mimic popular products that are not tobacco products. It's, it's very hard to deny when you see this in front of you. Next slide, please. And finally, um, I think it's important to know, like all of the other presenters have said, big tobacco is alive and well in your state. And um, you need to know that um, as folks who are trying to influence public opinion and also um, you know, promote policy. Know your tobacco lobbyists and name them. Um, our state has an ethics reporting website and we're able to look at that. That's something um, that we're constantly looking at throughout session because it is very common for the tobacco industry to add lobbyists. It's also a place where if you partner with other health serving groups, um, you can let them know. You know, your lobbyist is also working for Altria, but that's not consistent with our goals. And um, we have seen um, advocacy, we've seen our partners, you know, drop those contracts, which really tend to make people mad. Um, but also follow the money. You absolutely always have to follow the money. Um, and in our state, we have tobaccomoney.com. That's a, a website that we've had. Um, actually, Doug was able to work with, get that going, but that's something that we go back to year over year. Follow the money, the Institute of, um, as Ann Boone mentioned, that information is vital. Um, it's vital to know so that you can inform the policy efforts. What we have found during session is that sometimes lawmakers um, are uh, not always interested in that information. Uh, it kind of muddies things and these are people that they've known over the years and they're um, you know, great friends or whatever. But I think that it is important that lawmakers understand, especially freshman lawmakers, understand how the process works and how special interest um, seeks to advance their business model. Um, and pointing out that the tobacco industry has been adjudicated as committing racketeering is a, to me a very safe place to say, um, you need to know who you're talking to. And so um, we work on that throughout the year and also um, follow um, industry documents. Altria puts out a um, listing of their contributions each year. We look at that, we look at our state. Um, what we have seen sort of a nice byproduct of that is um, local Oklahoma affiliates pressuring their national office who may receive a large sum of money from Altria or others and saying, we cannot do business with um, a state agency that funds health programs because of your acceptance of tobacco money. And so we've seen locals pressure their national office to make positive change. So those are just um, some of the things that we're doing in Oklahoma. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity and the resources that are being put out there. Um, we have uh, contacts and links on the next slide. And resources. And uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. All right, thank you, Julie. And uh, thanks to all our speakers. Uh, a round of applause if that's possible. Zoom, I think they had a little hand clappy icon you can click somewhere. Um, Julie, in particular, I love the uh, Not Okay campaign. That, that is just brilliant. Uh, but not every state has that lovely okay to, to work with, <laughs> but, uh, but that, that is great. Uh, so now we're gonna open it up to questions and answers. Uh, you may note that uh, we have, we've given more time than we usually do on our webinars. We've noticed that we've run out of time to answer questions. So we have 90 minutes budgeted here. So hopefully we can get to all of them. Uh, so let me just jump right in. Uh, our first question is, has there been a decline in youth use since the flavor bans? I believe the answer is yes, but let's turn to our researchers and see if they can verify that and put some numbers to it. 
Yeah, I'll take a, I'll take a stab at this, and then I think uh, it'd be great, Anne, if you could talk a little bit about how the industry has uh, you know reacted to these flavor bands in particular, which have grown. You know, uh, there's been a, a huge growth in the number of local and state policies that have been passed <clears throat> on flavor bands. So I think the evidence is still in relatively early stages. Um, I do think we see um, some of the early indicators, so decreased accessibility. So we know when these laws are passed that they're less accessible in the retail environment. I think we also have seen good evidence that shows a decline in the sales of the certain products that are restricted. And so I, I think the early indicator evidence is good. I think it's the behavioral evidence that people are really waiting to see more on. And I anticipate that we will see more as states and locals continue their evaluation efforts. People are particularly interested in having the evidence. This will be important for everybody working in this area to know what impact this has in particular on youth and uh, younger people. And so um, just know that um, the, the field is quite active on this um, and really looking to advance the science um, in real time. So, um, you know, I think this is important because the industry um, is uh, quite active in pushing back on this. So I'm gonna bounce it over to Anne to maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, to add on to what you were saying, Barbara, that uh, you're saying sales have declined in for the products that are covered by these policies. And so I think that that's very important to, to note that it's important to have a comprehensive policy because we have seen that while, for instance, um, sales of fruit flavored um, e-cigarettes might have declined, we've seen uh, fruit flavored like cartridge e-cigarettes might have declined. We've seen an increase in menthol um, flavored e-cigarettes because those products are not covered by a lot of these policies. And so, you know, we're concerned about that because we don't want people to be shifting to, to other products or particularly youth. We don't want them to be shifting to other products. And, and another area where we're seeing this sort of shift is in disposable products um, that are, are still widely available in a variety of flavors. Um, and so, you know, this sort of reflects how the industry is, is um, reacting to these flavor policies. Not only are they opposing them altogether, but they're getting creative in the types of products that, um, that can pass through these loopholes. Um, you know, and again, they use a lot of similar arguments that we've seen on other tobacco policies that we've been working on for years. So just like in the smoke-free fight and in um, tax um, increase uh, fights, we've seen the industry argue that these types of policies are going to reduce jobs, are re going to reduce revenue, are going to, um, to uh, put businesses out of, or put stores out of business and things like that. And so, you know, we are, are working on data to show that, that these impacts are not as large as the tobacco industry always claims. They, they like to exaggerate a lot of these problems. Um, and while we don't, I mean, the point of these policies is to reduce tobacco use. So we do anticipate reductions in sales, but not to the great extent that the industry um, claims. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, um, the, the next two questions are fairly similar, but I'm gonna keep them separate just so we can uh, answer them more thoroughly. Uh, it's any tips on how to persuade candidates and office holders to refuse campaign contributions from tobacco interests would be appreciated. Even after informing candidates or office holders of Judge Kessler's ruling in the RICO case, the common response from the candidate office holder is, tobacco is a legal product, it's not violating any ethics rules to accept a contribution. They completely ignore any ethical or moral aspects. Uh, any insights on that from our panelists? Well, I can tell you um, what we have seen in Oklahoma. Um, we get that response as well. Um, but one of the things in some of your states where you may have uh, a, a, a group of lawmakers who are very transparency oriented is they are able to say, we shouldn't take contributions from any special interest. Um, and that may, that includes nearly everybody, you know, in our capital. So that's, that's one way that we've seen that happen um, in play out in um, among lawmakers. I mean, it has to be self-policing, right? And that's the hardest part because good lobbyists have good relationships and they've been doing it a long time. Um, you know, our capital is closed or, Everyone's supposed to be wearing masks, but you know who's there when the sun comes up? Same 14. You know who's there in the night? Same 14. Um, it is their business model to be friendly, affable, and to be around. And so I think when you're working with groups, um, 
where you have constituents, local people, local voters say, hey, I really don't think that's a good idea. Um, what are you going to do about it? Or other lobbying groups, maybe it's a, a pledge for, you know, cancer or other um, voluntary groups that might be able to come together on that. And depending on how aggressive um, your organization is able to be, um, you can publish those. You can publish those, um, those who accepted donations and um, you can publish them in proximity to votes if that is something that your organization can think about. That is not something that we have done as a state agency. Um, but it has been effective in other areas. In media, goodness. I mean, if you've got robust earned media, um, make friends and um, help them understand that information. Great, thank you. Any, any other comments on this question? I'm seeing still muted mics. Uh, if I can add one other argument that you might bring to the table, and it's a, it's a bit wonky. Um, we're, we're in one of the few countries in the world where this sort of thing is, is legal. Um, the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which we have signed but not ratified, but has 180 countries that have, uh, the, gu the guidelines to Article 5.3, which is on industry interference, say that you can't, you can't allow contributions from the tobacco industry to campaigns. And it also goes for the next question I'm going to read in a moment about, uh, um, about lobbyists. Uh, so just because it's legal here doesn't mean it's right. A global norm says it's not right. Uh, so the next question is, in our state, some contract lobbyists have tobacco companies as clients while simultaneously having clients of hospitals, youth organizations, health insurers, etc. Apparently, this is legal, but seems a blatant conflict of interest. Any suggestions how to counteract this? Who'd like to jump in first? Well, I can speak to that, you know, briefly, as you probably need to know the board members of um, those health clients and make sure that they're aware. I mean, oftentimes, lobbyists are hired because they're effective. And um, so helping um, board members or whomever holds the purse strings on those contracts understand um, the harms of tobacco and how this is counter to their goals um, might be a successful strategy. Great, any other comments? All right, moving on. Um, hi, I Googled drift to see what it was, but maybe explain a little. Thanks for the great presentation. And I have to admit, I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on what drift is too. So I'll be eager to hear the answer. I'll take a stab at this and uh, invite others as well. So um, I also saw, I think somebody called out VLO. So um, uh, drift, VLO, Revel, on, these are all example of these oral nicotine products, which are a growing category of smokeless tobacco products sold in the US. I think each major um, tobacco company now has one of these products. And so unlike traditional smokeless tobacco, these newer oral nicotine products don't contain tobacco leaf. Instead, they're made with nicotine extracted from tobacco leaf and they're sold in a variety of forms. So they can come in lozenge, gum, chewable tablets and nicotine pouches. So, um, and they also come in flavors, which I think one of our um, participants noted. So, you know, the concern for us, again, I think this points to an expanded portfolio of products. The potential is the concern that the availability of these flavored nicotine products, oral nicotine products, may appeal to youth and novice tobacco user users. And little is known about how these products are advertised to consumers. We're doing some research on truth on this topic. I mean, if you just do a quick review of online marketing, you see things like they can be used anywhere. Um, and uh, you see terms like tobacco free. So this is of concern to us, this emerging um, uh, area of uh, new products. So I don't know if others have anything to add to that. Uh, I just want to quickly add that um... Drift has been acquired by Reynolds. Um, and so a lot of the Drift products are now relabeled or yeah, relabeled Velo products. Um, and so that has expanded the, the variety of flavors that are available in Velo. Um, but I would also um, mention that because of these products containing nicotine derived from tobacco and not necessary tobacco, um, we're a little bit concerned that some of the policies that are, are um, that apply to tobacco products where tobacco products are defined as containing tobacco or made from tobacco itself may not apply to these products. So it's important to, to look at the policies in your state to make sure that the definitions are comprehensive enough to, um, to apply to these products. Um, and then one other concern is that similar to when SNUS was first released, they're very small and very concealable um, and can be um, 
can be mistaken for other products. And so again, just noting that youth could find these products appealing not only because of flavors, but because they can be easily hidden by um, hidden from uh, adults. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, will you discuss ALEC? ALEC is the American Legislative Exchange Council and their relationship to the tobacco industry. And I know that ALEC is one of the strongest weapons of the tobacco industry, but hopefully one of you has some insights into how to, uh, how to deal with them. Or perhaps not. <laughs> well, I can tell you what we've seen um, in the past, and I know um, voluntary groups work really hard at um, identifying champions that um, as they get closer to terming out might be more willing to take risks. And um, when some bills have been proposed in committee, um, it's important to uh, make sure that those champions have that ALEC um, standard language so that they can say, you know, what is the origin of this language and kind of get them on record. Um, we, Oklahoma uh, lawmakers are well represented um, within ALEC. So um, I think, you know, first and foremost, you have to find a champion and a, a lawmaker who is willing to call these things what that is. And whether that's minority party or senior um, members who are about to term out, um, that can be helpful. Um, I don't know how effective it is, but it does create doubt. And if we are going toe to toe with the marketers of doubt, um, then we need to expose opportunities where um, legislation is about furthering an industry's business model to addict and kill. Right, thank you. And if I, if I can just add really quickly, I know that um, uh, uh, some, some advocates around the country have used the tactic of um, finding out what else ALEC is doing because the, the, the tobacco is just the tip of the iceberg for them. If there's a public policy issue where there's a side that's against public interest, ALEC will be on it. And if you're going to a particular legislator, that even if they're not particularly caring about tobacco, they might care about one of these other issues and, and sort of be turned against ALEC. Um, Next question, well, first, uh, anybody else wanna to, want to comment on Alec? Okay. Um, next question is, how can we find out who our tobacco lobbyists are, uh, especially as I am nowhere near the capital? And I know every state is different, but let me, let me put it out there. Julia, I'm, I'm sure you've dealt with this. Sure, yeah. You need to understand the ethics laws or find someone who does. Um, if you're able to hire a lobbyist, your lobbyist will know because they have to comply with them. Um, and in our state, um, it is listed who their clients are um, and who are principal clients, and that would be one way to do it. I think there was another website mentioned here that would show, um, well, your, your website shows contributions to lawmakers, so never mind, but it may show you the organizations that are making those contributions, and then again, you can go back to your ethics um, and see who is um, the representative for that organization. Right, and I know that, as I said, every state is different, but uh, all of these things that we see as sort of unethical are, are technically legal, but most of our laws are designed around transparency. And so that information exists somewhere. You just gotta figure out how to navigate the system in, in, your, in your own state. Uh, any other panelists wanna comment on the, on the finding tobacco lobbyists? And I, I managed to skip a question, so I'm going to go back. Uh, do we have any data on how many lawmakers use tobacco products? And I don't, but I'm not a researcher. No, I don't. I don't. I don't think that that information is collected. Okay, that would be that'd be a good hole to fill sometime. Um, next question is: uh, Is nicotine naturally occurring in tobacco, or added by the tobacco company? And I, I know the answer is that it's naturally occurring, but maybe one of our researchers knows a bit more about how how addictive it would be naturally versus what it is in a cigarette. Um, I will start, and if anyone wants to add in, um, yeah, nic nicotine is naturally occurring in tobacco, um, but we know that the, the tobacco industry manipulates the products in when they produce, when they, um, yeah, when they put together the product, they uh, manipulate the different chemicals within cigarettes to enhance the nicotine, uh, the impact of nicotine, um, and they do this by various means. So, um, you know, we've heard uh, there are some companies, for instance, that, or there is at least one company that has produced low, very low nicotine cigarettes. So they've manipulated the plant to create very low levels of nicotine. I don't know a lot of the details on that. Um, 
But then uh, there's decades of research showing that the industry has added, um, has done things like add, uh, what is it called, shoot, uh, ammonia to, to impact the, the type of nicotine or the way that the nicotine is, um, is inhaled and, and then affects the body. And then of course, now we know that um, e-cigarettes are using nicotine salts, which again is chemically enhanced to increase the amount of nicotine that people um, can intake uh, when they use e-cigarettes. Barbara, so, did you want to add? I think you hit the you hit the high points there, Anne. So it was great. Okay, thank you. Um, with respect, this is for you, Julie, I believe. With respect to the corrective statements campaign in Oklahoma, were there challenges from the tobacco industry as to the content? And I guess that's because you're a state agency. Were they were they trying to use government levers to stop you? No. Um, you know, we made sure always in those campaigns where we're educating on the acts of the tobacco industry, um, we make sure to use their documents and to use things from um, those court rulings, which are out in the public domain. Um, and um, we're, we're simply restating facts. And so it is important that we stay there. Um, I will say that um, we are a state agency and um, I know of no other state agency in our um, state that has as many lobbyists who are interested and um, perhaps at some points working against our work. And so when we meet with lawmakers, um, we do try to point that out. No other state agency is facing this sort of scrutiny and opposition, and we will gladly um, comply with uh, transparency and anything else that we need to do. Great, thank you. Um, we have three questions left and in six minutes, we might get through this. Um, this uh, uh, participant said, I, I went to the Altria website and I saw a list of, uh, of contributions to political action committees and, and, and campaigns, uh, but there was no data available for the recipients of those, uh, those funds. Do you know what this means? Are there certain laws and states when publishing donations? And uh, the, he's specific, specifically from Oregon, if anybody has information on that. Where we have found um, information on local recipients has been within the community giving um, reports. So that might be the place to look. Um, this would be contributions to nonprofits, um, social groups, et cetera, um, where they would list those. It might be within their annual report section as well. And they're usually indexed by state. Great. Any other comments on uh, finding contributions? I do know that this is something Ash used to track, uh, at least for campaign contributions, not PACs. And uh, that, is, that is usually uh, transparent. And I believe the website is Open Secrets, where you can find uh, a list of contributions for each candidate by industry. And Anne, I see you un unmuted. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that um, followwiththemoney.org should have some state level data as well. Great. Next question, in state T21 legislation, I am seeing a cross out of terms for tobacco and e-cigarettes and replacing them with the term regulated products. Is the term regulated products concerning? Um, I can't say for sure. I think that it's definitely something interesting. <laughs> um, I would be interested in hearing more about it if you could contact me directly. Um, I don't know what state you're in, but uh, I mean, I'm a little bit concerned because there are things like, you know, until FDA had deemed um, authority over e-cigarettes, it didn't, it wasn't, e-cigarettes weren't a regulated product. So it sort of depends on how um, regula uh, you know, regulated product itself is defined. So if you could contact me, that'd be really helpful. Thanks. Great. And I think you had your contact information in your slide deck uh, and she followed up and said she is from Kansas, but oh, hopefully okay. we can put you two together. And um, I think this will probably be our final question. Uh, the tobacco lobbyists are more difficult to find since there are so many newer vaping companies and the big cigarette companies have bought and sold the major companies multiple times over the years. It takes time and digging to find them, but it is important. So I guess it's less a question and more of, a, more of an answer to some of our previous comments. And um, I thank Joel for that. Um, I don't see any other questions. So I may be able to give people four minutes of their day back uh, unless any of our panelists have any final word they'd, they'd like to put out. Okay, well, thank you once again. This has been, as always, very instructive. Um, and I look forward to continuing to work with you. And thank you to all our participants. If you have any follow-up questions or if you're watching this uh, after, we've, uh, after it was live, uh, please, please feel free to get in contact with us and we can connect you with the speakers. 
Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you. Have a great day.